When it comes to retro machines, the most common option seems to be builds revolving around Intel processors. For good reason too, while they were always good alternatives, Intel have produced a long line of both level setting and solid processors, especially during the 90s. Many of us cut our teeth on their successful series of 386, 486, and later pension processors. They helped shape the direction processor development went for decades, solidifying their dominance and perhaps their future complacency. After all, competition is good for everyone, not the least us consumers through better prices and features for what you pay. Many competing products were certainly good, but often had to be offered at a lower price to break into Intel's dominance, and they often lagged behind in benchmarks or features. Intel was THE company to beat. But while I do love a good pension style build, let's see what AMD managed to crank out toward the end of the 90s. Welcome back to Rick's Ram Retro, where sometimes it's something different than Intel inside. So what we have here is another random tower that I managed to say before it went to be recycled. Like so many other beige towers of the era, it served as a business machine of unknown function, but I believe it was something to do with phone or fax system based on where it came from. From a design perspective it's generic, but oh so 90s with its simple and understated style. It's also quite small if we compare it to other towers of the era making it fairly compact when stacked up next to some contemporaries. If we take a look around the back, one of the first things we notice is that a lot of the components we expect to be integrated are actually expansion cards, meaning the motherboard doesn't have a lot directly on it. Not an entirely uncommon practice when we look at the PCs from the early 90s, especially the AT style motherboards. Let's take this thing apart and see what we're dealing with. The case is held on by three screws on the back, which is par for the course for the era, nothing special there. Once those are removed, the case can be flexed outwards and slid off the machine, but as is also typical, it pinches, gets snagged, and is generally uncooperative. But in the end, it comes off revealing the innards. Let's take a closer look. We'll get to the parts more in detail as we dig in, but on first glance this is a Socket 7 motherboard that has a combo thing going, supporting both AT and ATX power supplies, which may come in handy. The only expansion card, if it can be called that, installed currently is the video card, so it's not much of a gaming machine, not that it likely was ever used for that. One thing to note are all the serial and parallel ports that connect to the motherboard back here, since they aren't directly integrated into the board. Let's get that video card out first and take a look. It's actually a 4 megabyte S3 Verge DX card, which uh, we'll take a closer look at later, but that's a good card for what this machine will be doing. Next, let's get some of this wiring mess out of here so we can actually get to the motherboard. Then we'll take out those expansion brackets, and uh, I have an idea for these when we put the machine back together. Last for the connectors we have the dreaded front panel wiring. So easy to take out, way worse to put back in. So to actually get the motherboard itself out, it's actually mounted on these little plastic clips. Uh, I vastly prefer the screws and the screwdriver method, but whoever installed this was pretty cheap, so they used these little plastic ones. And they are gnarly to get out of here. This was after a lot of work to actually free this motherboard. This is the last clip, so hopefully it should come out here pretty easily. No, it's not easy. It's never easy, but I think we finally get it here. Nope. 
back again. I just, I hate these clips. They're just, just terrible. Why would you use these? Why? There we go. The motherboard's finally free, at least. In all its glory. We'll take a closer look at this here in a minute. Shame on you, Clips. Shame on you. And too late, I realized that the motherboard sits on one of these little trays. That sure would have been handy as I took it apart. Next thing we need to do is take out the front panel, which pops off in a typical fashion. Let's just hold on with a few clips. Good clips, I might add. We're going to take out the 3.5 inch drive cage here, which uh, has the floppy drive and also uh, no hard drive, but we'll get back to that later. After that, we'll have to remove the CD-ROM drive, which is held on in a typical fashion, which is a few screws. This is a 32X CD-ROM drive, standard model. And we have to remove the power switch next, which is actually because this is an AT-style power supply, it's a mechanical switch that does run all the way back to the power supply. So it's actually grounded, as you can see here. We have to take that out, and then the power switch itself. The power switch actually works by a mechanical on-off switch versus an ATX style, which is basically a momentary power on. So this is actually, again, hardwired directly into the power supply, unique to the AT style. After that, we're going to go ahead and take out the entire power supply, which, again, is held on by normal screws in the back here. Fishing all those wires out, we're left with a very light case. With the motherboard fully freed from the case, we can go ahead and take the CPU on as well. But let's get the fan and cooler out of the way first. Lifting the lever holding the processor in place frees it from the socket 7 socket. That said, it's surprisingly in there considering these are supposed to be what they call zero insertion force or ZIF sockets. We'll go over this processor more later, but what we have here is an AMD K62 running at 300 megahertz. This particular one is using a 66 MHz bus speed, which could be considered the budget model of this particular one. The motherboard itself is a Tecram P5T30-B4E, this one being revision 1.1. Best I can find, this is primarily a board targeted to business deployment, but I could be off on that, so feel free to leave a comment if you run across this one before. Looking at it, it certainly threw the kitchen sink at it from a compatibility perspective. Featuring EDO and SDRAM memory slots, coupled with ISA as well as PCI expansion slots, all together with a Socket 7, gives it a very broad range of support. One that could be adapted to many deployments and somewhat future-proof it as well. That's especially evident with it supporting both AT and ATX power supplies. If you could throw the kitchen sink at a motherboard for this era, this probably would be it. Again, the CPU is an AMD K62 at 300 MHz using a 66 MHz bus speed. AMD launched the 66 MHz version down from the normal 100 to appeal to the people that didn't have access to a Super Socket 7 motherboard as a budget alternative. This is far from the speediest option of the day with the Pension 2 processor outclassing it pound for pound. But I think it's still an interesting option to keep in here and it's about as fast as this motherboard can handle per the manual and available jumper settings. That video card then is an S3 Verge DX with I believe 4 megabytes of RAM on board. This one is made by Eontronics, but again, since this was a business class machine, the brand is not something that's plastered all over the board to entice the consumer. That said, it's a great fit for this machine and the S3 Verge chipset does have some 3D capabilities, which we'll give a test once the computer is back together when we move on to the software side of things. With everything in pieces, it's time to get it cleaned up. We'll start with the front panel, which gets a scrub with some uh, light soapy solution and the soft side of a sponge. 
Like usual, you sort of have an escalating range of harsher products you can use to clean up these old cases, but I find that it's best to start with the simplest one, using just soap and water. Not to say some of the more stubborn spots still need some alcohol and mechanical force to truly get it cleaned up. Overall, I think it cleaned up quite nicely. Not like new, but there's definitely an improvement. The case itself gets a speed wash as well. As for the rest of the case, it's actually not that dirty, believe it or not. No hidden cobwebs or anything like that, but based on where it came from, it lived most of its life in a server closet with decent ventilation. A simple brush down with an antiseptic brush does the trick here. Now then, remember those little clips that the mother was held down with? Yeah, these evil things. Well, they obviously have to go. We're going to put in actual screws, so first, let's get those things out of here. They simply twist out one by one, slowly but surely, just not wanting to let go. Again, I'm not sure why they decided to use these for the entire one. I can see using this kind of a brace here and there, but they used it for the entire motherboard. I'm not sure if because they were cheap or just what the particular builder did, but they are out of here. Moving on to the CD-ROM drive, I noticed it had an odd sound to it when I was moving it around. That didn't quite sound right to me. So, I took it apart and I'd assume the bearings that allow the drive to actually spin the disc isn't supposed to sound like a loose bag of marbles. I'm not even going to try and use this drive at this point, and we'll just put it aside. With the warranty now voided on our old cyber drive, I'm going to go ahead and switch to this compact drive instead. And nothing special, just a normal reader, but it should do the trick for this machine. Now we'll just give the motherboard a quick cleanup, it's not dusty at all really, and a new clock battery, and then I think we're pretty much ready to reassemble. So then, with all our parts laid out and cleaned up, it's time to put things back together with some additions along the way.
So let's just pause here for a minute. I do a totally boneheaded move here, and considering what just happened, I'm pretty lucky. I plugged in the 80 power cables the wrong way around. I can blame it on inexperience with the standard or just idiocy, but there it is. This will explain what's going on later in the video, so keep that in mind, but I'm very lucky the board didn't fry when I powered on. Live and learn. Remember earlier when I mentioned I had a plan for some of the expansion slots to be taken off by the ports? Well, since this case has pre-made cutouts for some of these, I figured why not go ahead and move at least one of them up there. We should be able to fit the parallel port as well as one serial port to tidy things up a little bit. So one thing we haven't really touched on is the hard drive situation. Well for that we're going to go with a decidedly more modern option using one of these SD to IDE card adapters. 
If you watched my other videos, you've probably seen these pop up as I think they're just a great alternative to older failing hard drives. We can clean up and reuse a lot of old hardware, but when it comes to spinning disk hard drives, our options are limited, so these are a great choice. As far as mounting this into the case, when you have a friend with a 3D printer, you can get this made. It'll slot in with the expansion cards in the back of the case, providing easier access to the card. Unfortunately, this particular bracket isn't for this specific model and rather one supporting a full-size SD card, so it ends up a bit too far back. To remedy that in the name of improvisation, I'll just put this adapter on here with a bit of double stick tape. Is this the best long-term solution? Probably not, but it makes the card accessible the way we want it to. So one of the problems we face here is that because the way this bracket is mounted into the case, the IDE cable needed is just out of reach. As you can see, there's no way to get it over here, negating the whole idea with having it mounted where we want it. To our rescue comes a small IDE cable extender that should make this installation possible. Installing that... yeah. Installing that... Come on, actually install and now we can now bridge the connection to get it hooked up. The adapter is empowered by a standard power connector and we're up and running. Now then with all the basics hooked up, here comes the first power on test. And nothing. Dead as a doornail. Don't you just love working on old computers? So I isolated the problem to the power supply, which is old enough to simply be shot. Since this board supports an ATX style power supply instead, I went ahead and switched over to using DAT, which makes us have to revisit that hardwired power switch. More on that later. Well, that power supply was also a bust. Even though the machine was giving us power, it still wouldn't start, and I tried just about every other component. This one that's in here now, however, is working as expected, and we now have a properly booting machine. Huzzah! So on that power switch, since we're not using an ATX style power supplier, our old mechanical switch won't work anymore. I scavenged apart from another case just to get us up and running, but I have a better long-term solution for that, which should fix that issue for good. Once we're up and running, a real quick tour into the BIOS settings get us a bootable and workable computer. Finally. So, while we're going to finish up this video here, what do we have actually have left to do? Well, a few things really. First off, the power switch situation has to be sorted, which should be taken care of with this one I ordered. It blends together the on-off type switch with the momentary one our ATX power supply needs. I'd also like to address some of the airflow and fans looking ahead. Next, this isn't much of a gaming machine just yet, or at least in the way I had planned. We don't have a sound card, or our 4 megabyte video card may be good for DOS, but won't give us the performance we crave for Windows gaming. Which speaking of course, we have to install an operating system as well. I'd also like to make a callback to the title, as I realize that most of the parts with some exceptions for modern conveniences are from 1998. So we'll call this the 1998 gaming computer, which may give you a clue as to what else is going in here. But that will do it for part 1 of this build. Join me again in part 2 as we finish this build up and try out some games. Until then, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, perhaps you'd like to check out some of my other ones out as well. You can find me on social media and also at my new website at ricksrandomretro.com. If you want to catch me live, make sure to tune in at 8.45pm Central every Thursday for my weekly live stream.